Well, thank you all for tuning in. Hello, welcome Saturday morning, Wild and Scenic Film Festival goers. I am Jess Wagonski. I'm the Festival Director for Wild and Scenic, and I'm so excited this morning to be joined by the amazing author, Anne Velisis, here. Um, and thank you all so much for tuning in. Um, in case you are just joining the live stream, um, again, I'm Jess Wagonski. I'm the Festival Director, and I am joined here by Anne Velisis. She is the amazing author of Abalone, The Remarkable History and Uncertain Future of California's Iconic Shellfish. So, shellfish, excuse me, that was a little tongue twister. <laughs> Um, we're really excited to be joined by Anne today, and she's going to tell us all about her book, and we're going to learn a lot of interesting facts about abalone here today. Um, if you're just joining us live, um, please do chime into the live chat there in Inventive, and we'll have time at the end to address some of your burning questions, so be sure to use that live chat function, um, and we'll get to those at the end, but she's got a lovely presentation for us here. Um, I'm just going to introduce Anne really quickly and then hand it over to her so that she can kick off her presentation. So Anne Velisis is an environmental historian and independent scholar. She studied history and environmental studies at Yale and Utah State University. Her first book, Discovering the Unknown Landscape, A History of America's Wetlands, won two National History Awards from the American Historical Association and the American Society for Environmental History. Her second book, Kitchen Literacy, How We Lost Knowledge of Where Food Comes From and Why We Need to Get It Back was recognized by Real Simple Magazine as one of the 50 books that will change your life. Amazing. And her latest work that she'll be sharing with us today, of course, as I mentioned, is Abalone, The Remarkable History and Uncertain Future of California's Iconic Shellfish. And it has been called by Dr. Callum Roberts, as a truly marvelous, unexpected joy of a book. And so if you all needed some new books for your reading list, there you go, there's three right there. <laughs> and I'm so glad to welcome Anne this morning to talk about abalone. Do you wanna, do you wanna take it away, Anne? Yeah, sure. Thank you so much, Jess. Um, I love Circle and I love the Wild and Scenic Film Fest. It's always such an amazing event to be there in person in Nevada City, I'm sorry. I can't be with you all there together, but I'm so delighted to be here virtually, and I want to thank everyone for joining us this morning. So I want to begin this session by telling you a little bit about how I started on the path of writing a book about abalone. I was down in Big Sur, and I found a shell, this shell, and hopefully you can see some of its iridescence. Uh, it was just stunning to me. And I was literally inspired. I just had to know more about the animal that made it. As an environmental historian, um, I research and write about people's relationship with the natural world through time. And because I'm particularly interested in how food fits into that frame, I was aware of abalone as an amazing wild food. I think most people in California know what an abalone is. It's a wild shellfish that was for a time very abundant cherished and culturally significant, like salmon in the Pacific Northwest and uh, lobster in Maine. And when I started to ask around, I found people of a certain age who'd spent time on the coast had powerful nostalgic memories of foraging, diving for, and eating abalone. But answers to the question of what happened to them uh, were less clear, and many younger people had no idea what abalone even were. I soon learned too that some abalone had become endangered species. So I realized that there was a rich story to discover and chronicle and an urgent need to better understand how it is that we let the animals we cherish, especially those we use as foods, become imperiled. The story of what happened to abalone is important because it's part of our heritage and it's also relevant to the challenges we face today of conserving marine life into the future. So what I'd like to do is take you on a bit of an armchair tour through some of the epic history that I wrote about in my book, uh, Abalone. And um, at the end, we can, we can have some discussion and talk about uh, what's happening now with abalone. So let's begin with the basics. Abalone are marine snails. There are seven species in California and on the West Coast. These beautiful photos were taken by Buzz Owen, who started as a commercial diver back in the late 1950s 
and became a serious self-taught abalone taxonomist. Here he is with a big red abalone shell. Reds are the largest species in the world, and this shell is particularly giant. You could literally serve it. Abalones range along the whole West Coast, but especially in California. There's a cluster of species that generally favors cooler waters in northern latitudes, and a cluster that favors warmer waters in southern latitudes. They also have their own niches of depth, also related to water temperature. So some northern species live in the south in pockets of colder, deeper waters. Most abalone are subtidal. Here's a live red abalone. The holes in the shell are respiratory pores, which are used by the animal for breathing and also for expelling wastes and broadcasting gametes for reproduction. Abalone primarily eat kelp, sitting and waiting for torn off bits and pieces to float by, which they reach out to lasso with their tentacles. One species, the black abalone, is intertidal, adapted to put up with the dramatic changes between the ebb and flow of tides. So starting at the very beginning, the longest phase of abalone history is before people showed up. The oldest abalone fossils found in California are nearly 70 million years old, which is mind boggling, I think. Through millions of years of evolution, abalone developed a big powerful foot that enables them to grip to rocks and a strong shell that they can clamp down around them as shelter. Both foot and shell help to protect them in a sea of hungry predators. But both these attributes would later become compelling as a delicious meat and also as a brilliant, beautiful material when humans showed up. Most archaeologists now came to North America along the coast, a kelp forest highway. Some of the earliest evidence for human habitation on the West Coast is the remains of an abalone dinner eaten back at the end of the Pleistocene, a single shell dating back 13,000 years. Based on archaeologists' work examining the record of shells out of the Channel Islands, we know that shellfish were important for the subsistence of growing human populations for millennia. About 6,000 years ago, beautiful shell artifacts started to become more common in the archaeological record, revealing that abalone were increasingly used for cultural purposes, tools, ornaments, and ceremonies, and were traded throughout Native communities in California the desert southwest and the Great Basin. Here are some beautiful abalone creations made by indigenous people living around the San Francisco Bay around 1800, collected by British and Russian expeditions at the time. And this photo of a hoopa dancer from more than 100 years later shows abalone used in ceremonial dance regalia. It's important to note that abalone remain very important to native Californians to this day and continue to be used in ceremonial dances by tribes on the North Coast. One highlight of my book research was going to see a demonstration of traditional dances, dances where I learned that abalone is valued not only for its glimmer, but also for its spirit and song, the powerful sound that shells make when they clack together as the regalia is danced to life. The shimmering and singing of abalone in these enduring traditional dances represents a profound spiritual use of abalone shell that stretches back thousands of years up and down the coast. So the relationship between people and abalone entered a new phase with the arrival of the Spanish on the west coast, first with galleons, then with missionaries and more mercantilists in the 1700s a period of history that we're still reckoning with when indigenous people were subjected to the brutal disruption of their subsistence and culture, while newcomers with different cultural views took over their ancestral lands. The Spanish when mariners realized they could pick up brilliant shells near Monterey and then sail north to trade with native peoples far up the coast for sea otter pelts. By the turn of the 19th century, the fur trade moved south to California decimating sea otters and unwittingly starting to unravel underwater food webs. With their top predator plucked out, abalone that had previously lived in protected crevices reproduced without check 
spread out into more exposed areas and became super abundant throughout the nearshore marine environment. Monterey became famous for its shells, which British and American mariners called Monterey shells and California shells. But the name that finally stuck, abalone, was derived from the indigenous word of the local Ohlone people. Aulun, which you can see here as a place name on a historic Monterey map. And so I like to think that the word abalone continues to carry this deep indigenous heritage. The scientific name for California's abalone, Haliotis, also came into use around this time as European scientists started to identify American animals. The genus named Haliotis means sea ear, first named by Aristotle because the abalone where he lived in the Mediterranean were the size and shape of human ears. This illustration from an early 19th century British zoological journal is the first I found for a California abalone species black abalone. The most important thing to note about this pivotal time is that the new superabundance of abalone was fundamentally misinterpreted. Newcomers streaming into California regarded plentiful abalone as the natural state of the coast. They did not realize they were in an ecosystem that had already been severely disrupted. The next phase of human abalone history, which I call the abalone century, begins with a gold rush. Chinese immigrants sailed across the Pacific hoping to find gold, but some have found a different treasure on the rocky shores near Monterey in the flourishing abundance of abalone. An abalone rush soon began with hundreds of Chinese gathering abalone from shallow waters. The Chinese had a long heritage of holding abalone in high esteem for beautiful inlay work, medicinal purposes, and food, so a large export market quickly developed. Fishermen removed meat from shells, boiled it, salted it, and dried it on the beach. The final product was a hard chunk the size of a fist that, according to more than one reporter, resembled a horse's hoof. The cured dried meat was savored by the Chinese for its rich umami flavor. Um, at the time, white Californians did not regard abalone favorably as a food owing to racial prejudice and because they didn't know how to prepare it. After the easiest to pick abalone were fished out in the Monterey area, the rush spread south. And by the 1870s, the Chinese had developed an extensive trade network with large junks picking up big sacks of dried abalone from fishing camps peppered down the coast to San Diego and beyond. Millions of abalone were removed, but ultimately the Chinese abalone fishery was ended by broader racial hostilities when Congress passed the Chinese Exclusion Acts of the 1880s. This created a bit of a timeout for abalone to rebound, but soon a new group began harvesting. This time it was fishermen from Japan, which also had a tradition of holding abalone in high esteem. In the cold waters of Monterey, they started to use the new technology of hard hat dive suits and began to take untapped abalone from deeper waters. Each boat had a crew to support a single diver, pumping air down supply hose and hauling up large baskets of shellfish. Here standing with drying racks at Point Lobos is Genosuke Kodani, who is credited with starting California's modern abalone industry. And soon racks of drying abalone and large piles of shells became common sites up and down the coast to Los Angeles and beyond. So almost as soon as the abalone rush had begun, coastal communities raised alarm that too many abalone were being taken. By the turn of the 20th century, the massive buildup of intertidal and shallow dwelling abalone were diminished from what people had known and believed to be natural. And newspaper headlines warned that California's abalone were headed for extermination. This was a time when Americans were first becoming concerned about conservation. They'd seen that we could eradicate species through market hunting with the demise of the bison and passenger pigeons and East Coast salmon and shad runs had already been decimated too. There was an aspiration that California could do better with its fisheries by using scientific management. So the State Fish and Game Commission set size limits in 1901, then also directed 
USC biologist Charles Lincoln Edwards to study abalone in Southern California. Learning from Japanese, he became one of the first marine biologists to take a plunge in a hard hat suit. Edwards soon warned that the risk of extermination was real. He didn't think size limits were enough and recommended visionary strategies to conserve the fishery. A two-year timeout from fishing, setting aside abalone reservations, and rotating fishing around to different areas. His biologically based ideas were never acted on. But in 1913, the xenophobic legislature took a different tack to wholly prohibit abalone exports, reportedly with the aim of crippling the Japanese. So this was the second time that a racially motivated policy gave slow growing abalone a reprieve. Meanwhile, a new kind of interest in abalone had grown. With the arrival of the railroad in Los Angeles in the 1870s, affluent tourists started to come to California to appreciate the fresh air and beautiful scenery. And abalone soon became a star tourist attraction with visitors hunting for shells. At the resort on Catalina Island, one popular activity was to take a glass bottom boat tour to view undersea marine gardens. Tourists could pay their boatmen a quarter to dive down and retrieve an abalone shell, which soon became a quintessential California souvenir. The shells became popular north up the coast too. Here's a souvenir stand run by a Chinese fisherman's family near Monterey. Increasingly, too, more residents and visitors who identified as sportsmen started to hunt abalone for recreation. As the shellfish started to become more scarce in rocky nearshore areas, sportsmen blamed commercial divers for taking too many, while commercial divers thought that sportsmen were to blame. Conflicts between these two groups would continue for decades. Unfortunately, no one understood yet how the biology of this animal was fundamentally connected to its ecological history and larger environment. So in my book, I braided together different threads of abalone history, how abalone became a commodity through commercial fishing, an icon through recreation, and also how scientists started to learn about abalone. But I want to share a few stories about abalone, how abalone entered other elements of California culture, too. In the earliest 20th century, the stature of abalone hunting and eating was boosted by this set of well-known poets and writers, including George Sterling, Mary Austin, and Jack London, known as the Carmel Bohemians. After the 1906 San Francisco earthquake, they left the city behind and headed to Carmel to live a simple, creative life, writing poems and books, growing their own food, and foraging for abalone became a central part of their scene. The shellfish wasn't just a source of free food, but also a part of their vigor and inspiration. Sterling and London would dive for abalone and bring them back for beachside dinners. It turns out that an important part of preparing abalone's collagenous meat is that you have to pound it for an extended period to make the tedious job more fun. The Bohemians made up lines of rhyming verse to sing while pounding. It would have remained a playful private game amongst friends had the writers not been so famous. And I'd say this LA Times headline would definitely be clickbait today. In particular, Jack London wrote a novel with characters who traveled to Carmel, met up with the writers, and learned their ritual of pounding abalone and singing what would become known as the abalone song. So here we are at about half time, and I think we can use an entertainment break. So I'm going to teach you a couple verses of this song, which captures the Bohemian spirit. It'd be fun if we are all together, but the words are on the screen, and I hope you will sing along at home to the to the tune of Yankee Doodle. Okay, so here it goes. Oh, some folks some folks boast of quail on toast because they think it's Tony, but I'm content to owe my rent and live on abalone. We sit around and pound and pound, but not with acrimony, because our object is a gob of sizzling abalone. 
So hopefully that was as much fun for you as it was for me. And uh, you can find more verses of this song if you Google the abalone song. But you can see uh, that it would go on to be published as sheet music as part of the World's Fair of 1939. So uh, it was a well-known song. Abalone also became famous through the promotional efforts of one of California's first celebrity chefs, Pop Ernest. Pop developed a recipe for abalone fillets akin to the German Wiener Schnitzel. And when the state banned all export of abalone in 1913, he was well positioned to promote it as a premium seafood for California eaters, more specifically white eaters who were still mostly unfamiliar with the shellfish. Eventually, Pop built a restaurant right on the Monterey Wharf, buying his abalone from the Japanese fishermen, thereby helping to keep the fishery going strong. His restaurant became a destination for tourists and celebrities who wanted to try the increasingly popular shellfish. So as domestic demand for abalone grew, commercial take continued to grow as well. And his beds near Monterey wore thin, the industry moved south. Near Morro Bay, the Pierce brothers learned the trade of hard hat diving by watching the Japanese and started to harvest fresh beds along the central coast. With new gas powered boats and air compressors, divers could routinely take 100 dozen abalone a day. By the start of World War II in just a decade, a small number of divers had fished out 10 million pounds or about one quarter million animals. Through the 30s, 40s, and 50s, abalone was eaten and enjoyed in communities up and down the coast. Meanwhile, in Southern California, the new sport of skin diving was started in the 1930s. Here are the bottom scratchers, the world's first dive club. Early members would later recall they found abalone everywhere they looked when they first started. Skin diving and then scuba diving became increasingly popular through the 1940s and then especially after World War II, with more people foraging in deeper waters, taking and enjoying more fresh seafood and shellfish, abalone became a bigger and meaningful part of more people's lives. After the opening of the Golden Gate Bridge in 1938, recreational shore picking of abalone became more important for tourism on the North Coast which is one reason communities there fought hard to keep commercial abalone fishing out. So for an overview, you can see that annual landings from commercial fishing steadily climbed with a big break in the middle for World War II, when Monterey's Japanese abalone feat was terminated and the fishermen were sent away shamefully to internment camps. And white divers were directed to harvest seaweed to supply the war effort. Then when the fishery resumed after the war with many returning military veterans joining its ranks, the commercial catch ramped up to a high peak of more than 5 million pounds taken in 1958 alone. This, uh, this graph does not include recreational take. But soon thereafter in the mid to late 1960s, commercial abalone landings began to drop and then plummet without much advance warning. So what happened? A number of things we'll see, one after another, piling on to finally erode the mass buildup of broodstock and ultimately to reduce populations in some levels to alarmingly low levels. In Central California, sea otters rebounded. It was thought that these animals had been wholly exterminated from California by the fur trade, but a small population was rediscovered near Big Sur in 1938. It slowly expanded southward. By the late 50s, otters had entered an area near San Simeon considered to be the most productive abalone beds in the state. It soon became clear that they loved to eat abalone. It turns out that or otters forage for abalone by breaking their shells with a rock. This set off a bitter and intractable conflict between commercial fishermen who wanted the state to corral and move the otters elsewhere and those rooting for their recovery, the group called Friends of the Sea Otter with its influential leader, Margaret Owings, a story I tell in greater detail in my book. 
But this is a key pivot point in the story, because up until this time, people believed that abalone were an inexhaustible, sustainably harvestable seafood, and that their prevalence was natural and owed to the animal's inherent super fecundity. But the return of the sea otter pointed to a whole new and different understanding. In short, there would have been no abalone fishery at all had sea otters not been wiped out earlier. The abalone fishery had been based on a historic mass of built up stock, a windfall that was being increasingly mined out by fishermen and now otters too. At the time, knowledge of kelp forest food webs with sea otters as keystone species influencing the entire ecosystem was still just emerging based on new ecological research in Alaska where scientists studied islands with and with it out, without otters and found far richer kelp forests where otters were present. I think many people are familiar with this, but for those who aren't, the drawings on the right show the basics. On the top, the otter keeps the kelp raising urchins in check, allowing for the rich kelp ecosystem to flourish. On the bottom, when urchins become dominant and graze down kelp, it simplifies the whole ecosystem. It was impossible to apply this new, uh, this new science from Alaska to California, um, more complex, which had more complex ecosystems, especially in the midst of such a contentious conflict. But it raised many new questions and was the start of a paradigm shift where we began to see the wild animals we use as foods, not only as a crop to be harvested every year, but also as parts of more complex ecological communities. There was simply a lot more going on underwater than we knew. Meanwhile, as the sea otters expanded their range southward, fishermen were compelled to abandon their prized abalone grounds. Sea otters became a protected species and red abalone persisted in their traditional habitats of protected crevices, but there was no longer that surplus for commercial fishing. At that point, California's abalone fishery moved south again with bigger and more powerful boats, commercial divers were able to work reefs not only off the Southern California mainland, but also the Channel Islands. And the recreational take in these areas continued to climb too. And so it should come as no surprise that abalone became increasingly scarce. By the early 70s, California state biologists determined that overfishing had already significantly reduced brood stock in many areas and that the animals couldn't keep up. They tried to institute a limited entry fishery, but the politics of ratcheting back fishing proved impossible. Another thing that happened in Southern California were El Ninos, a big one in 1958, and then an even larger one in 1983, causing massive storms and warm water. Up until the 1980s, it's important to remember that people considered these big storms to be aberrations. Scientists and fishery managers were only then starting to realize that El Nino's were regular oceanic fluctuations that occur on an episodic basis. Strong El Nino's affected abalone in several ways. Warm water and storms devastate kelp that abalone eat, thereby reducing the animal's ability to both grow and reproduce. Up until this time, it was generally presumed that abalone reproduced every year, but scientists who studied what happened before and after the 1983 El Nino discovered this was not the case. So there was continued fishing on top of stocks that were not regular, regularly reproducing, but that wasn't realized until years later. Dr. Mia Tegner was a marine scientist I write about in my book. She was interested in both abalone and El Ninos. And by the 1990s, with rising concern about global warming, she would realize that El Ninos were like postcards from the future, already showing us the insidious ways that elevated seawater temperatures could deeply affect marine life. So another problem hit in the wake of the 1983 El Nino too. This before photo was taken on the remote shores of Santa Rosa Island in the early 1980s, where black abalone still thrived, spread out all over the intertidal zone of this remote area. 
biologists surveying marine life in the intertidal zone, the new in the newly designated Channel Islands National Park, soon found black abalone that normally clamped hard to the rocks during low tide were hanging limp and loose and then dropping off helpless. The biologists soon realized they were witnessing an epidemic. Over the course of just a few short years, 99% of black abalone in the Channel Islands withered up and died. Then the mysterious pathogen made it to the mainland and spread up and down the coast too. It was alarming for the biologists to see so many animals die in such a short time. They called it withering syndrome. Ultimately, pathologists would determine it was caused by a bacterium that became particularly active in warm water and that it could afflict other species of abalone as well, albeit to a lesser degree. And if that weren't enough, biologists realized too that no one had seen a white abalone in a long time. When they failed to find them with regular dive surveys, they searched deeper waters with a small submarine. Here's one of the state biologists climbing into the Delta sub. Over the course of several days, Park Service and California Department of Fish and Game researchers surveyed 77,000 square meet meters of reef and found only four white abalone. Here's a view from the sub looking at one of the lone white abalone too far away from any possible mate. Reviewing the data and historic surveys, the biologists hypothesized that the once abundant animals had been unwittingly fished out, leaving too few animals too far apart to reproduce. It's called the Ellie effect. When animal populations are reduced to extremely low levels, they have trouble reproducing because mates can't find each other. In the case of abalone, the animal's gametes broadcast into seawater can't find each other. This realization made the abalone biologist realize that it was critically important to monitor not just numbers or pounds of abalone, but the density of abalone too. As state biologists pieced together the dire straits of the black and white abalone in Southern California in the early 1990s, these animals, along with pink, green, and red abalone, were still fished commercially and were increasingly vulnerable to poaching too. At that point, the biologists came to the painful realization that California could no longer manage these animals for a fishery. It had to manage them to survive. This is another crucial pivot point. And in my book, I tell the story of how recreational divers from throughout California came together in a contentious high stakes political campaign to press the state to finally close the commercial fishery and their own sport fishery from San Francisco South in 1997. Ultimately, white abalone would become the first marine invertebrate to be listed as an endangered species in 2001 and the black abalone would also be listed in 2009. In retrospect, it's important to observe that it was not easy for fishery managers to foresee when animals would reach a critical tipping point from being wholly available for the fishery to becoming imperiled. Even in the face of the warning signs, it was hard to ratchet back California's abalone fisheries because fishers vigorously argued that there were more animals to fish, even as the populations and distribution of abalone shrunk, and even as cumulative environmental threats piled on. This underscores, I think, the importance of taking a precautionary approach to managing all animals that we still use as wild foods and ideally of having an agreed upon management plan in place ahead of time so everyone can be on the same page when the chips are down. I think it also points to the need for people from more diverse perspectives, not only fishers, to become engaged in public processes and to advocate for fisheries and conservation. Um, so I wanna shift gears now to tell you more about what's been happening to some of these animals more recently and especially some of the exciting recovery efforts. So with endangered white abalone, you were, uh, excuse me, the animals were so few and so far apart that biologists knew there would be no way they could ever reproduce. 
So back in the late 1990s, they decided to bring in some of the few remaining animals from the wild to start a captive breeding program. In my book, I recount this effort with all its monumental challenges and amazing discoveries. The bottom line is that it's much harder to recover an endangered species than it would have been to conserve it in the first place. But after some heartbreaking setbacks, in the past couple of years, there have been some exciting milestones of success. The captive breeding program is now anchored at Bodega Marine Lab, and scientists there have finally figured out how to breed large numbers of healthy juveniles. Here you can see one of these animals up close. NOAA Fisheries, which has purview over recovery of endangered marine species through the Endangered Species Act, has funded and orchestrated pulling together many key partnering organizations, the California Department of Fish and Wildlife, California um, Universities of California, Santa Monica Bay Foundation, and several other Southern California coastal aquaria to scale up the recovery effort. And in the fall of, of 2019, just a little over a year ago, captive raised white abalone were finally outplanted for the first time. Putting these tiny abalone out into an ocean full of predators is part of the challenge for recovery. And so different methods are being tested to see what will work to best help protect these animals until they can become established. Remarkably too, some additional wild abalone have been rediscovered, which is helping scientists to better understand these animals and also to provide for critical genetic diversity. This is a continuing project. The ultimate goal is to get lots of white abalone pulse planted out into the ocean where they can reproduce on their own and help rebuild a viable population. And hopefully all that is being learned in recovering these most endangered abalone can be applied if need be to other species and other marine animals into the future. With the endangered black abalone, the intertidal species most heavily afflicted by withering syndrome, the approach has been different. It was always hoped that there might be some pockets of disease resistant animals. And it turns out that in a very few places in the Channel Islands, black abalone have persisted and may now be starting to show some signs of rebound. They've also persisted in central California where water is cold. Another hopeful thing is that scientists studying withering syndrome discovered something different when they were assaying tissues about seven years ago. It turned out to be a virus, a bacteriophage, that breaks down the disease bacterium. Additional research has confirmed that abalone afflicted by withering syndrome can endure the infection, infection better and with far fewer symptoms if the virus is present too. In recent years, researchers have determined that this bacteriophage virus has spread through most California waters where the withering syndrome bacteria is present and may be helping to make it possible for black abalone and perhaps other species to recover. And so believe it or not, a virus may well be a hero in this abalone story. Meanwhile, the pink and green abalone of Southern California never became endangered, but they became severely depleted. After 23 years of fishing closure, they may be slowly starting to rebound now in some spots. But in Orange County, still empty nearshore reefs, efforts to kickstart green abalone recovery have been spearheaded by marine biologist, educator, and volunteer coordinator extraordinaire Nancy Caruso. Planning closely with Department of Fish and Wildlife, Nancy has collected wild broodstock from the Channel Islands and is now raising green abalone at local aquaria, aiming to rebuild a local nearshore population. Nancy and her team volunteer divers who do surveys, monitoring, and watchdogging of restored abalone exemplify what it means for people to develop a new kind of relationship with abalone, built on building an ethic of getting to know local places and getting inspired to restore and steward marine life. And finally, we must return to the red abalone of Northern California. As I mentioned earlier, Northern California communities had always resisted commercial fishing and also scuba diving. So a free diving only sport fishery there had long thrived based still on that historic buildup of abalone broodstock 
and continually replenished by red abalone parents in deeper water than could be reached by the breath hold divers. Thousands of divers and shore pickers were coming each year from all over the state and beyond to hunt for abalone in Kelpridge coves and then repair to campgrounds to pound and fry up abalone in a tradition that in some families had spanned generations. But then a perfect storm of environmental stressors hit. In 2011, there was a harmful algal bloom that killed off hundreds of abalone off the Sonoma County coast. In 2013, sea star wasting disease swept up the coast, decimating sea stars, including these sunflower stars, now considered to be mostly extirpated, except for some remnant populations up in Canada. It turns out that sea stars are important predators of purple urchins, and so without them, aggressive kelp-eating urchins grew without check. Then in 2014, a marine heat wave hit called the blob from the north and El Nino from the south, making it harder for kelp, which need cold nutrient rich water to grow. Between ravenous urchins and warm water, Northern California's kelp forests were reduced by more than 90% in just a few years, leading to starvations of fowls of red abalone. Dr. Laura Rogers Bennett, who started a kelp forest monitoring program for the California Department of Fish and Wildlife documented these heartbreaking changes. And in 2017, the California Fish and Game Commission was compelled to close Northern California's beloved abalone fishery. So the massive scale and speed of this undersea transformation has been sobering and is another blaring alarm bell about the reality and perils of our climate crisis. People are now looking at different ways to address the problem. There are efforts to create urchin-free oases with sport and commercial divers removing purple urchins, urchins in strategic coves to maintain pockets of bull kelp and red abalone. Sometimes scientists are working to bring back the sunflower sea star, that voracious urchin predator, through a captive breeding program. In Southern California, people have long tried to restore smaller areas of degraded kelp forest, and so there are important lessons to draw from there too. Perhaps most important is that while all these efforts help, ocean conditions remain an overarching driver for canopy kelps. Meanwhile, we've also come to realize that these great undersea forests are incredibly important for sequestering carbon and thereby helping to stabilize larger climate conditions too. So kelp is key, everything is connected, and there is a lot at stake. And so as citizens of the West Coast and of planet Earth, we find ourselves in another pivotal moment, which underscores to me why history is so important. The stories that we tell ourselves about how we got to now are literally the stepping off point for the future. Embedded in the history I've shared this morning, and especially in my book, we can gain a deeper appreciation for some of the profound and enduring cultural values of abalone. And we can see early generations derived tremendous economic benefit and enjoyment from abalone. But now these modest animals need for us to give something back. Hopefully the perspective of history what we've gotten wrong and right in the past and all that we've learned can inspire and help us in this project. We need more people to learn and care about marine environments, to fall in love with the rich beauty of these places, their plants and animals, and to get involved in supporting community science efforts. And we need more people to advocate for abalone recovery, for endangered species, for marine ecosystems, and for addressing the climate crisis. There will be no easy answers, but we'll need to come together to find ways to rebuild resilience in our marine ecosystems if we want marine life to endure into the future. As I worked on my book, a telling detail I discovered early on stuck with me, that many different cultures have associated abalone with vision. And so it is my hope that sharing this story of abalone can help us all to see a better path forward for these cherished creatures and for all the life of our sea and earth. 
it's time to get on it. So thank you very much. That was wonderful, Anne. Thank you so much. If we were in a in the activist center together, we'd be clapping and, and cheering your presentation. That was beautiful and informative and educational. Thank you so much for sharing with us. You're welcome. Yeah, we've got a few audience questions that we can get to now. Um, and one question that I had too for you, seeing that up close of the abalone from like seeing its little face, was I like was smiling from ear to ear on the side of the camera. Was there anything while you were writing your book and doing research that totally took you by surprise or really excited you? Something that really stuck with you while you were writing your book, something that just shocked you? Well, you know, I think I'll, I'll tell you two things. One is one of the great privileges of writing my book was I got a chance to go out to the Channel Islands, um, which is uh, one of the places where uh, abalone have thrived and been most abundant historically. And, it, you know, there's the Channel Islands National Park out there. It's an extraordinary ecosystem that's kind of, uh, I wrote in my book, it's kind of like an alter ego to the citified mainland. And seeing those um, ecosystems out there, seeing abalone thriving in um, the intertidal zone, those black abalone recovering, uh, was a real high point to me, especially after, uh, you know, doing the research about um, abalone's decline. That was so hopeful and positive for me. I think I was also incredibly moved to do the research related to um, indigenous people's uses and meanings of abalone shell in the deep past. Um, it was a challenging part of the book to research and discover, um, but it was fascinating to me because it was sort of a glimpse into a very different way of thinking about animals and these animals in particular. So um, that was also a fascinating thing. Yeah, and I so appreciated that you ended with um, leaving us with the restoration efforts and leaving us with a hopeful note too. Um, that was really lovely to end on. So we've got a question from the audience here. So can you speak about the serial depletion of abalone starting with whites? And can you talk about the domino of El Nino and urchins outcompeting abalone for food? Competing in the... Yeah, one of the things um, I'll try to say that one of the things uh, that happens, of course, is there's no easy one thing to blame when you try to figure out how species are imperiled. It's often this uh, stacking up of things that happens. And so the person asking about cereal depletion, what happened is I described as the abalone fishery moved from, you know, near Monterey south. Uh, it went, it started with the red abalone as the dominant fishery. And then as those creatures got, um, knows those animals were fished out and became less abundant. The fishery moved to a different place and eventually moved to the Channel Islands. And then as those animals, the red abalone were fished out, the fishery moved to pink abalone and then to some of the other species. And so um, we, at the time, the fish and game division was looking, measuring abalone primarily um, by pounds landings that were taken in and were, weren't really paying attention. They didn't have the capacity to understand what was happening in all these places. So that's kind of how the cereal depletion happened, how this happened before people understood it. Um, and uh, when urchins become dominant, as I described, they also uh, can take over, they can outcompete abalone for food when they become dominant. And they can also start taking over the reef um, and uh, making it harder for abalone to stay uh, established. So those are some uh, quick answers, um, but that I go more into in detail in my book. So hopefully that will give you some idea of the many complicated and fascinating uh, aspects of life under the surface and kelp forests. Wonderful. Another question from the audience. Um, great job and it's so fun to see you, says Dave. Um, are abalone found off coast of Alaska or other international cold water, cold water coastlines? Yes, they are. Um, and the species uh, that I 
uh, write only a tiny bit about in my book is the Pinto abalone, um, Haliotis kamchatkensis, I hope is the best way to pronounce it. And it stretches, it actually is in California, but it stretches far up into, uh, through the Pacific Northwest into British Columbia and Alaska. And it too is um, a species that is now imperiled. Um, the Pinto abalone was not it was recently a candidate species for the endangered species uh, uh, listing. It was not chosen to be, or I mean, it was not deemed to be uh, needing of that designation. But in the state of Washington, uh, they have endeavored to uh, try to restore the abalone, kind of in a parallel effort with what's going on with white abalone in California. Uh, and it has a similar history, you know, it's an animal an important to indigenous people and abalone, uh, a uh, fishery animal that got overfished uh, for a time when abalone uh, fishery was so important. And it's just important to underscore, underscore that these animals are slow growing, sedentary creatures. And so they're incredibly vulnerable to overfishing. And then as I described um, at the end of my story, because they reproduce in the ocean, they send their gametes out into the ocean. They're also incredibly vulnerable to changes in the larger ecosystem, you know, changes in ocean temperature, but also pH, which of course more of us are, you know, worrying about now with ocean acidification. So um, these animals have challenges on many levels. And so, um, you know, they stand, they need all the help that we can give them, all the support we can give them. And they also stand um, kind of as sentinels for so many other invertebrate, marine invertebrates that, that live out in these ecosystems as well. Absolutely. Um, and here is a question from Paige. Um, oh, this is interesting. I had this question too. So where do jewelry makers source abalone they use? Um, are they all endangered or is there a sustainable resource? That's a really good question. And, um, you know, so up until uh, just a couple of years ago when the red abalone fishery collapsed in Northern California, you know, people could get those shells. In fact, a lot of indigenous abalone, um, indigenous people were diving as sport divers. Um, and, uh, but what has happened also increasingly that jewelry makers are turning to take get shells from other places like um, Pawa in New Zealand or um, other places buying abalone uh, or using other shells. In fact, when I was talking to some indigenous dancers, I asked them about that question in particular. And they said, well, gosh, if we can't get it, sometimes we just have to, you know, get shells from elsewhere. Um, so that was pretty heartbreaking to me. Um, and uh, just made me, it was just one of those things that makes you realize how many, um, how culturally important these animals were and are, and how, how much is at stake when we lose animals like this. Absolutely. If there ever is a recreational diving season again, how do you think the future regulations should be formulated, including daily limits and annual take? Yeah, this is a really good question. And I think what we have to do is sort of rethink our whole thinking about abalone. You know, we've, we've always had this, um, we've had such a, sport fishing has been such an incredibly important part of the culture um, of California. Um, and so I think what we're going to have to do is wait and see if these animals can rebound, so wait and see um, how um, there's got to be enough of them uh, that can reproduce and if for there to be a fishery. And I'm thinking, I'm envisioning, imagining that it might have to be more like what happens with a, with hunting, like a, where people can get tickets and go and hunt abalone in specific areas, something like that. Um, but really it's going to depend on what happens, you know, I mean, that's sort of what I, I think I know, but people who've hunted and fished abalone forever would love to have the fishery back. And, um, but it's really going to depend on what happens to the ecosystems. Um, it seems one of the things I underscored is that abalone don't reproduce every year. We used to think that they did and that they could just continually replenish, but as sort of that brood stock gets smaller and smaller and smaller, um, you know, it's going to take a while to, to rebuild any populations to a fishable state. Right. Good question. Yeah. From Dirk. Thanks, Dirk, for your question. Um, and maybe like back to a, a really basic question. Um, what inspired you to write about abalone? Why this particular topic? Well, as I described, um, you know, I had 
I had written other books about the history of food and ecosystems. And I actually, I kind of ran into the stories of shellfish while I was researching those books, oysters on the East Coast and in estuaries in San Francisco. And so I was aware that um, shellfish are particularly interesting animals because we hunt them individually or people, you know, and, and they've been a food, but they're also, especially, you know, oysters can be considered ecosystem engineers. Um, so I was just aware of shellfish in general. And then, as I mentioned, I found that beautiful shell and um, on the Big Sur coast. And uh, another detail I didn't, didn't mention is I would find little pieces of shell, you know, scattered on the landscape. And I was just, it was so poignant to me that the story of this animal seemed to be, we seemed to be losing it. Um, and uh, it just seemed incredibly important to, to document it. And when I started to talk to people and learned about how powerful and potent their memories of these animals were, what, how meaningful they were um, to so many people, um, I just felt like it was a very important thing to write about. It turned out to be a more complex topic than I ever imagined because of that ecological history that was unknown until, you know, not basically 50 years ago, but that the fishery had persisted so long without really even understanding the animal. And then so much uh, that became evident even just in the past decades. I developed a tremendous appreciation for the difficulty of understanding the science of um, marine life because um, it's so difficult to go underwater into the realm of these animals and try to track, try to learn about them and what happens to them. And so, um, you know, I think a lot of times people would just suspect, well, don't we know everything about these animals? We still don't know a lot about these animals and so many other animals. So um, anyway, I found that all to be incredibly fascinating and inspiring. I love to learn things. I'm a totally curious person. And so, uh, but I think fundamentally it was the beauty of that shell that really inspired me. Yeah, they're so striking. And I think maybe we have time for one or two more questions. So um, let's see, we've got one from Aaron here. So due to all these negative forces on the abalone, is anyone still eating abalone? And are there any responsible sourcing for consumption? Yeah, that's a great question. And there are a few artisanal um, abalone mariculture operations in California. Um, one of the ones that I think is really neat is um, the Monterey Abalone Company, which raises abalone on the wharf at Monterey in um, kind of cages uh, where they can, you know, where they can be underwater and protected from sea otters. Um, the thing that is always a challenge for raising abalone is they're such slow growing animals. So it takes so long for them to grow. Um, the animals raised in that facility are, you know, premium seafood that can be eaten at restaurants or people can buy it, but they're, you know, they're smaller than probably what hunters, people who have foraged for abalone would, um, would be used to. There's another one up the coast as well out of Davenport. Um, but I think it's also, so I think there's some possibility for artisanal um, abalone production. In Asia, there are much larger abalone farms, um, but it's important to say that the same things that we face in the ocean um, impact aquaculture as well. And so, for example, um, in China, I think it was, I can't remember if it was a year or two ago, there was a mass die off of abalone at abalone farms. Um, because of hot, hot water disease. So anyway, you know, there's, I, I think that um, one of the things that's an interesting positive through the research on restoring abalone is I think people have become, come to understand some of the limits of aquaculture more, but also some of the ways to make it safer ecologically. So um, anyway, that's something of interest, definitely. And we're just, we're closing in on time here, um, but Anne, I'd be curious to know um, how your, what your um, current distribution is with your book. Are you working on a new book? Are you currently working on getting the word out about abalone? What are you up to other than talking to us today? Well, I'm currently working on getting this book about abalone out. Of course, this book came out at the peak pandemic when a lot of bookstores and libraries are closed. So um, it's been kind of sharing the word about this book, word of mouth. So if anybody wants to, uh, you know, sh share it, I'd love it. Also, I wanted to mention too, that if anybody is interested in buying this book, 
um, the publisher of this book, Oregon State University Press, is going to offer a discount to festival goers. If people want to buy this book by the end of the month, you can go to the Oregon State University Press website, and the special code is abalone. You can remember that, and they will give you a 30% discount and uh, a free shipping. So um, I'm getting the word out. I also do activism about uh, the, wild, the habitats where I live up in Oregon. Um, I'm getting interested and engaged in abalone up here as well as working on salmon. So, um, and still figuring out what my next book topic is gonna be. This one took me about 10 years. So I need to kind of figure out what I have the energy for next. Wow, that's incredible, 10 years. Well, and maybe we can we can work on getting that information about purchasing your book with that discount code in the description here in case folks tune in later for on demand or the folks watching today want to revisit. We'll post the link here in the description. Great, so can access that. Um, well, we're at about time, but it sounds like um, Anne might be. Are you still if you're still interested, we can hop over to the virtual lobby, which is another space where folks can continue engaging. I think we're going to drop a link to the lobby there in the chat. And Anne, do, are you going to hop over to the lobby? Yeah, I'd love to hop over to the lobby. One of the things that's so fun about the Film Fest is talking to people in the in the lob, lobby in the hallways afterwards. So let's pretend that we're there and we can do it. So great to have you, Jess. And again, thank you everybody so much for coming and joining me today. And uh, I hope you'll consider buying the book Abalone and learning more about abalone and marine environments into the future. They definitely need everyone's help. Okay, thank you so much. And really appreciate you joining us here at the Wild and Scenic Film Festival. Hope you all have a great rest of your day.